Um, hello everybody and welcome to this theory video. Uh, this will be um, quite a lengthy video because we've got quite a lot that I want to get through um, in this recording. Now as a reminder, what you can hopefully see on your screen now are what we call the possible macroeconomic objectives. So economic growth, low unemployment, um, low stable inflation, um, ensure that the current account is in a position where we can balance the balance of payments, solid government finances, look after the environment and to reduce income inequality. Right now, what we're going to focus on in this video are demand side policies. And this really is about what can we do to make sure that aggregate demand is in the best position possible to support macroeconomic performance. Right, what we'd like to do, first of all, please, can you scribble down these questions in your books? Hit pause and write down your answers. And then what we'll do, we'll go through the answers to these different questions. By the way, there is a bit of a mistake. On B, it says close off a positive output gap. C then says close off a positive output gap again. Can you change C to say negative output gap? So B should be about positive output gaps. And a C question should be about negative output gaps. Right, anyway, everyone, um, what you've hopefully remembered is that a negative output gap is linked to aggregate demand being below YFO, which means there is spare capacity in the economy. Um, a positive output gap is the exact, exact opposite. It's where AD is beyond the LRAS curve. So a negative output gap would mean we've got spare capacity, which genuinely means that inflation is too low and you've got unemployment, whereas a positive output gap would be that inflation is too high due to high levels of scarcity. Right now, fiscal policy is one tool that can be used to improve um, the state of aggregate demand in the economy. So if we were operating in a positive output gap, we'd be looking to what we call deflationary or contractionary fiscal policy. This will be achieved by raising taxes and or reducing government spending. So what you'd expect to happen here would be that government finances would improve. So what that would mean is that budget deficits would start to fall or budget surpluses would start to increase. Now think about how this should work. If you were to um, raise taxes it will reduce the ability of households and businesses to consume and to invest and that would help reduce aggregate demand in the economy government spending is also an injection so if governments spend less in the economy it means there's less demand for nurses doctors police officers and it means the government is spending less in the country which will also bring down aggregate demand and that will be used until ad moves back towards trend rate growth to bring down that high rate of inflation um, the opposite of that would therefore be what we call inflationary or expansionary fiscal policy. So this would be used in a negative output gap. So here aggregate demand would be too low. So we would increase aggregate demand by raising government spending and or reducing taxes. And that would have the desired effect of raising aggregate demand back towards trend rates or the LRAS. And that will helpfully um, create more jobs in the country. Um, inflationary or expansionary fiscal policy would lead to government finance deteriorating with the logic being that if you are raising government spending and or lowering taxes it would mean that budget deficits would get bigger or budget surpluses would get smaller. Uh, we can show these in another way as well. Now the, the reason why I've gone for a Keynesian LRAS curve is because this is generally a Keynesian policy so using fiscal policy to influence aggregate demand. Uh, the gentleman in the top corner of the page is Rishi Sunak, and his job is the Chancellor of the Exchequer. So he's the person responsible in the government for setting the UK's fiscal policy. So whenever we need to adjust government spending or taxes, this will be the guy that will make those decisions and share them on behalf of the government with society. Uh, so you can see in the diagram what would happen. So in the bottom left hand diagram, we can see the impacts of expansionary or inflationary fiscal policy. So we're moving AD outwards by lowering taxes and or increasing government spending. Um, in the bottom right hand corner diagram, we can see that AD is too high, which can create high inflation. So you'd move AD inwards by raising taxes and or lowering government spending. 
Now, quite clearly, um, in the bottom left hand diagram, when you expand through fiscal policy, this would lead to government finances getting worse. So budget surpluses will get smaller or um, budget deficits will get bigger. If you go for the opposite, the contractionary policy, it would lead to government finances improving. So budget deficits will get smaller or budget surpluses would start to get bigger. Right, you've got some pause questions now. Uh, what I'd like you to do is to have a go at defining all of the following key terms. So if you can hit pause and jot down your answers, please. And of course, when you're finished, please hit play. Right, OK, now if we were evaluating the effectiveness of fiscal policy, you've got a few different arguments that we can go down here. Um, the first one would be the size of multipliers. So if we were using expansionary fiscal policy to boost aggregate demand, if you've got a high marginal propensity to withdraw, it would re reduce the effectiveness of that policy. So if savings rates were high or demand for imports was really, really high, it would mean a big chunk of that injection from the government would leak straight back out of the economy. So what you would argue is that fiscal policy is more effective when you've got big multiplier effects, which would mean that the MPW is very, very low. Now, another problem with fiscal policy is that governments often lack information. So it's very difficult for governments to have full information about the state of the economy, the state of businesses and the state of individuals finances. And what this information failure could mean is that governments bring in policies, which is maybe not best for what the economy would need at that moment in time. Uh, the next one is the time lags. So if you're adjusting government spending or taxes to have an impact on aggregate demand, well, that decision by the government can take a long time to filter through into the economy. So, for example, if you're in a recession and want to boost aggregate demand, you might raise government spending and lower taxes. Well, the, the, the time it takes for that policy to have an impact on the economy, it could be too late. So that means that, you know, it's very difficult to have an instant impact on the economy through fiscal policy. So you've almost got to anticipate the future when you introduce fiscal policy. If you wait for the problem to happen, it's potentially going to be too late. Now, the next one is something we call the crowding out of private investment. And this one's linked to expansionary fiscal policy. So the idea would be if governments increase spending massively, then it means that the government are providing more goods and services for people. They're expanding healthcare, education. They're demanding more of the country's resources. Now, what that does, it makes it more difficult for the private sector to grow. So you are literally stopping the private sector from growing. So a good example, if the government were to build lots of high speed train lines, they'll be hogging all the engineers, all the businesses that work in construction. And that will prevent house builders from building more private housing, from businesses building and expanding their companies because the government are hogging all the engineers. And that literally stops that private growing and making the investments. Uh, now, a link to this as well, we, we'll be looking at this later, and is looking at how governments borrow money. Um, there's only a limited amount of money in the economy. So if the governments hog massive chunks of the money, then it's making it more difficult for private businesses to borrow from banks to fund investment. So the, the, it might grow the government sector, but this could be really, really detrimental to the private sector in the economy. Right now, further to this, um, free market economists would argue that government spending is really, really inefficient. So logic would be that governments might not have full information on what households and what businesses want. So taking decisions away from the free market mechanism can create what um, these economists would, would argue government failure. So the more governments intervene, the more risk there is of government failure taking place. Uh, the next one. And this one ties in with the crowding out argument as well, and it's linked to higher borrowing costs. So when you have expansionary fiscal policy, um, you, you tend to find that governments to attract the borrowing, the, the people willing to lend to the government, have got to raise interest rates. And this will push up the interest rates that mean you pay for our loans as well. So these higher borrowing costs will then filter through to everybody. And that could mean, you know, mortgage people pay more to buy property, businesses pay more on interest on loans that they've, they've taken out to fund investment. So this could, again, crowd out private investment. Now, um, a classical economist would argue there's no point. 
even bothering to raise aggregate demand or to reduce aggregate demand through fiscal policy because the logic would be that markets are perfect and markets will clear anyway so if in the long run we're going to get back to LRAS with no need for lots of government borrowing then why bother just let the free market mechanism fix problems across the economy logic would be if people are unemployed then wage rates will fall and that will incentivize growth of businesses and we get to where we want to be anyway without the need for lots and lots of government intervention um, you've also got the problems of debt as well so expansionary fiscal policy would lead to government debt increasing significantly and that will mean in the future um, we've got to be looking to repay that debt so the UK at the moment has got over two trillion pound of national debt so that means that what we will need at some point is what we call fiscal austerity. So where government spending will need to fall, taxes will increase, and that could negatively impact on people's living standards um, at some point in the future. Now, I just want to include this one. Um, this slide here talks you through how governments borrow. So remember, the idea is that governments will have to borrow money um, whenever government spending exceeds taxation if they haven't got any you know savings built away like other households do now the way that governments borrow they don't walk into the bank like you or i would do they will borrow through what we call bonds or through gilts now i'm just going to pause for 30 seconds to let you read the information on this slide and then we'll go through some of these more complex things in a little bit more detail so please just spend 30 seconds or so reading through the information on this slide Right, guys, now let me just go through some of the main ideas on here then. Not going to go through every word on here, but the idea is that when governments borrow money, they are borrowing potentially billions of pounds at one time. So there isn't a single financial firm that really has got what we call the liquidity, you know, is that the money tucked away to be able to invest um, into government debt. So what we do is we raise money for the government through bond markets. So what will happen is lots of financial firms generally from the UK, but some across the world will buy government debt. So the idea would be you might borrow and you can look at the example here, a £1,000 bond and that will have a fixed interest repayment on it of, say, £50. So if you think about it, what that is giving you is an interest rate of 5%. OK, now um, a lot of these bonds tend to be long term. So the example could be that your parents might um, have their money tucked away by their pension company in government bonds. So th that means that the money's tucked away for 30 years and they've got a good solid rate of return on that investment. And the good thing about these types of lending to the government is they're really, really safe because the UK government has never defaulted on debt. So the idea is everyone that when governments borrow to fund budget deficits, they do it through what we call a bond market. Right now, you've got this here um, and this is what we call the bond yield and the price of bonds. Right. OK, now, um, again, what I wanted is just to pause for 30 seconds and give you a chance to read the information on this page. So 30 seconds, everyone read the information that you've got. Right, guys. Now, the idea here that is that when people buy bonds, um, they need to have what we call liquidity. So if you're taking out, let's say, a five year bond, then within that time period, you might want to raise the money back again quickly because you need the money or you want to invest it somewhere else. Now, with that in mind, you tend to find that we have what we call second hand bond markets. And this is a bit like a stock exchange, for, but for bonds. And it's where people can buy and sell government bonds. Now, the idea is what this does, it makes the bonds more attractive in the first place because it means that you can sell them on again um, if you ever need the money back. So what this is, it allows what we call greater liquidity. We're allowing people to access money, their money back by selling the bonds. Right now, look at the numerical example that we've got then. 
Um, suppose the price of bonds were to rise from £1,000 to £1,500. Now, remember, the interest repayment to that £1,000 bond is £50 per year. So if someone was to pay £1,500 for that bond that you bought for £1,000, then it means that the interest rate has fallen to 3.33%. Now, you tend to find that the price of bonds might increase when um, other forms of investment have become more risky. So in a recession, for example, people might choose to buy second hand government bonds because they offer a nice, safe, secure investment. So the idea would be that when people sell their bonds, it might only say it's worth a thousand pound on the bond. I'm going to have to start this again. This is crap. <laughs> 